president here at the Reginald F. Lewis Museum of Maryland African American History and Culture and it is our honor to host you this evening um, as we have a conversation about black history and arts. And um, as you can imagine, I'm kind of a popular person to have speak during the month of February. I can't figure out why, but it seems that I am. And I've had the opportunity to talk a little bit about just the importance of arts and black history and how arts and black movements have gone so closely together. Where a movement occurs, art will arise. If it's uh, placards that are uh, painted on doors, if it's um, Black Lives Matter that's written in the street, or if it is truly like a black arts movement, which occurred after the civil rights movement. And so where change exists, art will be created in its many various forms. So I'm thrilled that we're having this conversation here this evening. Uh, before I take my seat and introduce to you Dana Moore, I have to do my pitch, which is, please come back and visit the Reginald F. Lewis Museum. There's a lot to see here. We have a fabulous new exhibit called Black Woman Genius, which is a tribute to Elizabeth Talford Scott. We also have her daughter, Dr. Joyce J. Scott, who is in the exhibit, and we feature African-American women who are fiber artists. So please come back. The exhibit will be up through September, and if you aren't, a member, consider becoming a member. I have been putting the feet to the, to the sidewalk over the past few days in Annapolis and today in DC uh, to make sure that we are included in funding. We don't always get what we need to get. So we need the support of everybody to continue to have this organization thrive. With that, enough of my commercial. I'm going to bring up my friend Dana Moore, um, who is going to introduce our program this evening. Thank you, President Freeman. <clears throat> It has become our tradition at the Office of Equity and Civil Rights that whenever we have events at the Reginald F. Lewis Museum, we always open with a word 
from the president of the Reginald F. Lewis Museum. And you always remind us of why we are here and we are here to support, not just to engage and enjoy tonight, but to keep coming back to the Reginald F. Lewis Museum. You are one of our anchors. And I know that the mayor would like me to say how important you are to the city of Baltimore and how much we appreciate all that you do. Um, you often say that you are the town square, you want to be the town square, and you have been for us. So thank you very much. So tonight is really very, very special. It's very rare that we are able to assemble in a beautiful museum uh, founded by an amazing human, Reginald F. Lewis, and bring uh, art and culture, history, civil rights, to bring it all together in one space. Um, this is happening because Mayor Scott asked that it happen. <laughs> this fantastic event. Uh, we know that February is a special month in Baltimore. We know that this week is a special month. We have, I'll be leaving out of here to go back to the CIAA, another black event in black Baltimore during Black History Month. And I want to thank everyone who has helped to pull this event together to nice conversation featuring the dynamic uh, presence of our native sons. Of course, the incomparable on their shields a fashion visionary and recent winner of the 2023 Project All-Stars Vishme Formate. Yes, congratulations. <laughs> and creative powerhouse TV Walk Away. <laughs> I got some tips backstage, so if y'all see me designing my own suits, watch out. <laughs> I want to thank each, and each of them for being here and to be a part of this, but also for showing what Baltimore is to the world each and every day. So thank you, uh, gentlemen. I want to thank uh, the fantastic moderators for my team, uh, our Chief Equity Officer Dana Moore, who you, who you heard from. Thank you for what you do every day. My Senior Advisor for Arts and Culture, uh, Tanya Miller Hall. I want to thank Terry and our family, not friends, but family here at the Reginald F. Lewis Museum for hosting us uh, to celebrate black history and what they do each and every day. I know I'll be here like three more times this week and I was here last week. Uh, we know that we have to continue to uplift this museum, come and visit, become a member, but also hold your events here. Uh, make sure that people are in this museum, in this space consistently to make sure that we are talking about and showcasing all that is the historic history of black people across this world. I won't take up too much time, but I want to do something a little special. And I think, uh, Mr. Shields, you've heard this before, but one of the things about my job I really don't like is presenting citations, except for things like this, when I feel like it's some uh, folks who we really should honor and really appreciate. And as we say, give your flowers while you're here. So uh, tonight I'm gonna honor each of our special guests with a mayoral salute not only in just in honor of Black History Month, but in recognition of your outstanding achievements and exceptional contributions to the arts. Uh, your work embodies the spirit of innovation, resilience, and cultural enrichment that Black History Month celebrates. It reflects the depth and diversity of Black artistic expression. So, on behalf of all of the residents in Baltimore, Thank you. And we're going to call you all up individually. Abishmay, we're going to start with, with you first. Come on up. All right. This mayoral salute is for you. Uh, Vishnay Kramate, in recognition of your spirit of innovation, resilience, and cultural enrichment that Black History Month celebrates. Your artistic endeavors have not only elevated the community, but have also served as a beacon of inspiration, showcasing the profound impact of black artistic expression and heritage on our society. On behalf of the people of Baltimore, I commend you on your contribution to enriching the cultural tapestry of our city, assigned today by me, Mayor Brandon Scott. Congratulations. Oh, okay. This is for uh, Mr. Stevie Walker Webb. And with that, for the people of Baltimore, I am pleased to salute Stevie Walker Webb in recognition of your spirit of innovation, resilience, and cultural enrichment that Black History Month celebrates. Your artistic endeavors have not only elevated the community, but also have served as a beacon of inspiration, showcasing the profound impact of Black artistic expression and heritage on our society. 
On behalf of the people of Baltimore, I commend you on your contributions to enriching the cultural tapestry of our city. Thank you very much, and congratulations. Mm. Certainly not least, this is to Mr. Andre DeShields on behalf of the people of Baltimore. I am pleased to salute you in recognition of your support of your spirit of innovation, resilience, and cultural enrichment that Black History Month celebrates. Your artistic endeavors have not only elevated the community, but have also served as a beacon of inspiration, showcasing the profound impact of Black artistic expression and heritage on our society. On behalf of the people of Baltimore, I commend you on your contributions to enriching the cultural tapestry of our city. Thank you very much and congratulations. Sir. his own designs, yes? Uh, he learned the basics of sewing from his aunt, and after graduating to a sewing machine, he began making friends for friends and family. We have that in common. I used to make all of my own clothes, <laughs> and no joke. And there are a lot of people out here who are like, thank God she learned how to shop. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, his clothing line has earned him international acclaim. Vogue magazine declared his clothing sculpts and celebrates a woman's body. His work is described as confident, sexy, and architecturally captivating. Yes, yes, awesome, right? Um, his garments reflect characteristics of that art that inspires him, boundary breaking, fun, daring, romantic, and socially conscious. And I think that's something we really wanna explore with you tonight is the socially conscious aspect of your work. Um, Bishmi was a highly regarded contestant on Project Runway Season 17, and he came back in 2020 and was crowned the winner of Project Runway All-Star Series. <laughs> One of the things that I just absolutely loved about your, your background was um, your sharing that there's so much more to you. Yes, than Project Runway 20, and you want to really explode that and expand that, and I think hopefully Tanya and I will together bring that out, yes. right? That's yes, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. Um, Bishmi's mission as a black designer is to encourage self-expression, advocate for representation, and shatter the expectations of people of color, and I think this is a perfect conversation to have for Black History Month. He has dressed Lizzo, Andre Day, Karuichi Trash? Karuichi Trash? Okay, y'all. <laughs> all right, all right, I'm back. You know, I'm still stuck in Civil Rights Week 2015, so I'll get there, I'll get there with you. Um, <laughs> Karuichi Trash. Uh, this one I know, Nisi Nash, my girl. This is Bishni. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Stevie Walker Webb is Baltimore Center Stage's artistic director. He is a director, playwright, and educator. He was recently nominated for a Tony Award for directing the Broadway production of Ain't No More. Ain't No More. <laughs> Stevie's work has been commissioned by the National Black Theater and the American Civil Liberties Union. I would really like to explore the the, you know, the differences between those two because they're really, really different. So let's, let's talk about that. Um, he has directed productions with the Paper Mill Playhouse, The New Group, Classic Stage Company, and I just love this name, Wooly Mammoth Theater Company. <laughs> he has also written for the Emmy-nominated Emmy television show, The Ms. Pat Show. This, this really kind of struck a chord for me, and this got to my heart. You're the founder of hundreds of thousands an advocacy organization that uses the arts to raise awareness about the treatment of mentally ill, incarcerated people in solitary confinement. And hopefully you'll be able to share us a little bit of the story about why that is so important to you. And I think that's a message that um, we in Baltimore really would, would like to hear. Um, you're also the founding artistic director of the Jubilee Theater in Waco, Texas, 
uh, where your brother was incarcerated. So this tells us a little bit about the story, and I'm going to stop there and let you tell the rest. You are the recipient of the Princess Grace Award, the Dramatist Guild's Lily Award, an Obie Award, and a fellowship at the New York Theater Workshop. Stevie, thank you so much for choosing Baltimore. <laughs> So much for saying yes to the invitation to join us tonight. I feel like we've got the trifecta here. I, I jumped on the train. I left rehearsal early to be here. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Andre De Shields. You ready? <laughs> Andre is Baltimore's own. Um, Born in, on January 12, 1946 in Dundalk, Maryland, he quickly moved to Baltimore City. Uh, for all those who want to know the answer to the classic Baltimore question, Dr. Mr. Shields, DeShields graduated from Baltimore City College. <laughs> from there, he attended Wilmington College, University of Wisconsin in Madison, where he earned a BA in English Literature. That was my major. I loved, I loved English Literature. Um, and, and then a Master of Arts in African American Studies from the Gallatin School of Individualized Study at NYU. Doc, Mr. DeShields, I keep calling you Dr. Shields because we have, uh, yes, I, yes, but we have a, a friend with that name. Uh, Mr. DeShields began his professional career in 1969 in the Chicago production of Hair. Yes, I know. Yeah, isn't that amazing? He then moved to off-Broadway off productions during the 1970s, 80s, and the early 1990s. He's co-written in music, directed stage productions, and of course, performed. He is well known for appearing in the title role of The Wiz, directed by the amazing Jeffrey Holder. Maybe we'll get you to put on your dancing shoes before you leave tonight. I don't know. Somebody said that. <laughs> well, Leah, can, can you work with us on that, Leah? <laughs> uh, he has received an Emmy Award in 1982 for Outstanding Special Achievement for his performance in, anybody can tell me? Ain't Misbehaving. He received his first Tony Award in 1997 for his role in Play On, received a second Tony Award in 2001 for The Full Monty, and received a third Tony Award in 2019 for his role in Hades Town. Just to be clear, <laughs> the first two are nominations. Oh. I actually won the Tony on the third nomination, which is Hades Town. Three times the Tony. My husband and I have a gorgeous granddaughter, and it's she who introduced me to Amy Spatula's grandma. You gotta hear this. You just you gotta listen. Um, and just I hope I got this right. You got the Grammy in 2020, also for Hades Town. For all of your accomplishments, you've never forgotten Baltimore. And even tonight, when you first spoke, you said thank you to Baltimore. Baltimore thanks you for all that you've done and for always remembering us and for always accepting the invitation to come on back home. So we have a, a few questions. Tanya and I. I'm going to introduce myself. Oh, My wait, name is no. Tanya Miller Hall. Oh, okay. I am the senior right. advisor for arts and culture for the mayor's office. And now, see who got our three guests to come and to be here tonight. So thank you. Both to give and to receive them in the arts community. I'm going to just throw this out to the group. I'll start. First of all, when I won my Tony Award in 2019, the first thing I said was, Baltimore, are you in the house? Because I was reaching out to the place that made me. Because as you know, if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. But I made it in New York because I first made it here in Baltimore. The first individual 
to respond was Tanya Miller. And I want to thank you for that. And I'll have you know, I will do whatever this woman says. Okay, now, that's out of the way. In terms of legacy, I want to start here. When I got this invitation, I was so happy that black arts was combined with black history. Because where there is black art, there is black history. Where there is black art and black history, there is black activism. Where there is black art, black history, and black activism, there is black revolution. And where there is black revolution, there's no place for it to start than right here in Baltimore, which I hold in my heart as the toe of the North and the head of the South. Baltimore. Now, at the turn of the 20th century, W.E.B. Du Bois said that the crisis of the 20th century would be the color line. Here we are in the 21st century, and that crisis still exists, right? Now, why is there a crisis of the color line? Because in the 16th century, the imperial heads of Europe decided that white people were supremely human, and everybody else was subhuman. I want to start there because we were always referencing the Constitution of the United States of America. It is a lie for us. I refer to this country as the United Plantations of America each of the states being its own plantation. If you want to understand the Constitution, you should read the Magna Carta. And that'll let you know exactly where we stand on the ladder of humanity. The other thing that took place in the 16th century was the invention of race as a social construct. We are the bedrock of this country. We are, through our blood, sweat, and tears, the reason that this country exists. Our art created America. Our history continues to create America. And it is our revolution that will save America. As artists, it is our responsibility to respond to the only five questions that exist. Who, what, where, when, why. Who, the Africans who were kidnapped from the west coast of Africa. What, enslavement that created the new world. The history of this country is the history of the black African on the North American continent. Where? But we now know from imperialist Europe, across the Atlantic Ocean, 
where the Europeans believed there might be dragons to the New World. When? Well, we give it up to Cristobal Colombo, we say 1492. But long before that, you ever wonder why this continent is called America? Anybody know about Americus Vespucci? And the Vikings who were here before him? Right? And when Columbus did arrive here, he thought he had reached the Spice Isles of the East, which is why the indigenous people here are called Indians. He thought he had reached India. Shows how smart they were. So that's who, what, where, when. Now, why? Because today, politically speaking, geopolitically speaking, the world is in shambles. Why? Because of 1884. We don't know our history. So, Andre. Let me just say this one other thing. Okay. When you have an opportunity, research, Google, if you will, 1884. It's the Conference of Berlin when all of the European crown heads got together and partitioned Africa. When I was growing up, I was always wondering, why do they speak French in Algeria? Why do they speak Dutch in Suriname? Why? There's is colonialism. But that is what we are still dealing with. And my legacy as an artist activist is to find the throne to which I know I am heir. Is there anything else left to say? <laughs> I guess we should go to the next question. Do you guys have a follow-up to this? I wouldn't even try. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> we just did it. Me, you did win Project All Stars. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. You recently talked about your new collection that you wanted to be intentional about sustainable fashion, uh, sustainable manufacturing. Um, can you tell me how that's translating into your collection now? So uh, as far as like being sustainable, and uh, it's all about like understanding where your materials come from and allowing yourself to work with people where you know where everything's come from and you understand how they're creating it. Um, a lot of the things that I love to do with my collections and also with my brand is I love working with mom and pops or like family owned businesses in a way. Um, because it lets me know that my money is allowing a, a business that started to grow, um, that started from nothing to help grow. Um, and for me, it allows me to also know how and where everything is coming from. So it, it kind of, the sustainability comes from you understanding where the materials are, but also connecting in a way with the people that help create the vision um, and help create the product that you have in mind. It's amazing. So when I, I mentioned when I was growing up, I used to make all my clothes, and one of my favorite places to hang out was a store called G Street Remnant, which I don't, oh, it was, it was just a beautiful, beautiful place, just walls of silk and all, all kinds of fabric. But anyway, Stevie, this question is for you. Um, and uh, You're relatively new to Baltimore. Um, Hale, originally from Texas, I think. What was it that made you say yes to Baltimore? Because you didn't have to say yes to Baltimore. I absolutely did have to say yes to Baltimore yeah. uh, for so many reasons. Um, I always say that the art that I work on, um, it chooses me often way before I choose it, right? There's that scripture in Jeremiah that talks about um, uh, being predestined to a thing. And I felt like, uh, I feel like uh, Baltimore 
I don't know. Uh, my first time here three years ago, um, I was coming to do a production of a play called The Folks at Home. And I worked all over the world, Madagascar, Johannesburg, South Africa, Central and South America. I mean, all over the United States um, and have lived in New York for 12 years. But there was something about when I came to Baltimore for the first time three years ago, I got off, uh, got out of Penn Station, and my feet touched the ground, and I felt like um, I had been looking for a home for so long. And there was something about the molecules of this city, the culture of this city, it shifted something in me. And being on Mr. Deshim, we're talking about this um, backstage just, just a few moments ago, that um, I, I feel like Baltimore is the last great American city, the last great cultural capital of, of, of this country. And the reason why um, is because having worked and lived all over the United States, um, a lot of what's happening in, in, in all the great cities is that they've been, they're being bleached, they're being gentrified, they're being capitalized on to the point where working artists can't afford to make art in the cities that they once called home. But this city, even, even, even though it's, it's evolving into this, this cultural destination, it already has been, but the world is waking up to its promise. This city resists intuitively that kind of bleaching, that kind of erasure of culture. I, I, and I just think that that is so unique and magical and powerful. And um, I, just, I just love Baltimore. It's like the home I've been looking for for, for so long. That is so beautiful. Yeah. Oh, that is so beautiful. The, the audience, I think, loves that you said that. And I think a lot of us feel that way as well. I chose Baltimore after living all over the country and in Washington. I sat at the Inner Harbor in the amphitheater, um, this is many, many years ago, and, and just smelled. Um, at that time, the uh, McCormick Spice Factory was, was downtown. And re remember that, guys? It was so long, it was so long ago. And it just, I just said, this is home for me, and it, it just it grabbed me. Um, Bishmi, you, you hold on to Baltimore in your art. And one of the things that stood out for me when I when I started reading about you was your Green Mount jacket. Yeah, yeah, yeah? yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, amazing. And my husband and I lived not too far. Actually, my husband and my niece Allison Duggan, who's an amazing artist in her own right, uh, we we all live within walking distance of Green Mount. And I kind of started you at thirty third in Green Mount, which is now occupied by two gas stations, a pizza joint that closed and a chicken joint that will probably never close. Yes. Um, and then, right, just one, and then you go down Green Mountain and there's just so much, so many flavors on Green Mountain. I want you to talk just a little bit, if you will, about what inspired you to honor Green Mountain on your clothing. Uh, well, specifically that season was season 17, Project Runway. Um, I think it was so weird for me to, at the time, it was weird for me to have this platform for something that I love doing. I love creating clothes, I love, I love expressing myself. I use it as like a journal. Um, so again, it's like I'm a, I'm a black man from Baltimore, Maryland. The only time you see a black man on the news from Baltimore is if you've done something wrong. And then it's like, well, what is the best part I can do to allow it to be like, especially from Baltimore, how can I connect to people that would only know where I'm from and be like, wow. And then I, I made a bomber jacket. I love bomber jackets. And then I was like, how, how, excuse my French, how ballsy would it be to put Green Mountain on a bag? <laughs> I, I don't talk like that. I'm just trying to, my bad. <laughs> I just trying to, I just was like, how, how, how impactful would it be um, for someone that's, on, that's in Green Mountain in Baltimore to see a jacket to read it and be like, I know exactly what he's talking about. Um, and it's still commercial in the way that anybody who don't know what I'm talking about, they're gonna buy it because it looks cute. But if a person is <laughs> actually from there, they're like, oh, I'm, I'm seen right now, I'm able to be seen. Um, so my reason for doing that was to allow the, per the person that's just like me, how I was on Green Mount 33rd watching Project Runway, telling my sister I'm gonna win that show when I get on there. So that's what we're gonna do.
Yeah, I, I recently watched Project One White 17, and you carried Baltimore through most of your collection, yeah. not just the Greenmount jacket, but most of your, and most of your reference points were was Baltimore. So staying on that Baltimore theme, and Mr. DeShields and his, you know, taking your first Tony, um, your first Tony speech, your first words was a shout out to Baltimore and you left the audience with some nuggets, the three cardinal rules. Do you want to remind us what those three cardinal rules are? If I may. <laughs> and, wait, and, before, and before you go, if you haven't seen his full speech, you should YouTube it. But here it is. He's not gonna do the full speech. <laughs> <laughs> My three cardinal rules for longevity, and sustainability. Cardinal rule number one, surround yourself with people whose eyes light up when they see you coming. Cardinal rule number two, slowly is the fastest way to get to where you want to be. Cardinal rule number three, the top of one mountain is the bottom of the next, so keep climbing. Yeah. Love it. Stevie, let's talk about um, your impact and your activism uh, through art. Um, I recently read that when your brother was um, incarcerated, you staged a protest um, to sort of bring light to mental health issues and incarcerating people with mental health issues. Can you talk to the audience about what that protest was about? Absolutely. Um, I, I love talking about the work, even though talking about my brother in relationship to it is um, still painful. Um, but my, my history of art and activism goes back, I mean, geez, uh, forever. Um, the the uh, theater that I founded in 2010 in Waco, Texas called the Jubilee Theater, um, the work there in that theater grew out of a response to stop the gentrification of my neighborhood. And so now, gosh, you know, so over a decade later, this theater runs year-round after-school programs. And um, we commission uh, black women writers, first time black women writers, and we have uh, story circles for uh, disabled veterans. Um, and so all of that work, uh, I've always seen art and activism as, a, as a, having this like inextricable relationship. In fact, I think about theater um, and Baltimore Center Stage as, as the church in the wild. It should be the kind of place that no matter who you call God or if you call God at all, that you you can you should be able to come there and it should feel like a raucous Sunday morning service where you're having a good time and you're talking to the to the stage and you're feeling impacted by. Matter of fact, I want to make sure y'all all awake right now, so we're gonna play a quick game. When I say yes, you say no. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. 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 No. 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 Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. Yeah, so you know, you know, you listen. But, um, but um, I, I believe that art and activism has an, it's like you cannot separate the two of them. But speaking specifically to hundreds of thousands, thousands in 2020, um, my brother um, had a, a mental episode. He's neurodivergent. Um, he, uh, it was the height of the pandemic and he could not get access to his a psychiatrist to have his med, his med suggested. He didn't do anything wrong. He was in our front yard, and I'm actually the person who called the police. And uh, there's a documentary coming out next year that's going to be nationally syndicated through PBS, uh, uh, American Reframed. You should be looking for it. The film's called Hundreds of Thousands. But um, it's about, um, I called the police because I have a degree in social work. And so I got off the phone with a social worker. They said they were going to send um, uh, an emergency mental health response team to the house because my brother was actually looking for help. The police arrived before uh, the response team uh, arrived, the mental health response team, and ended up spending um, 122 days in solitary confinement um, in a six by nine foot cell. Um, and as you can imagine, the grief and the 
a deep responsibility I felt in being the person to make that phone call. Um, I was uh, in New York at the time um, and I drove 27 hours because I couldn't get on a flight. No one back, just couldn't find a flight out. I was the, I had the pandemic. So I drove 27 hours across the, the country um, to uh, organize to get my brother released. Um, it was, uh, the, I wasn't making any headway and so I ended up doing a performance. Um, and so I, I organized an entire community. Um, there were uh, quite literally hundreds of people reached out to me from all over the nation. Um, when I put out the call, said, you know anyone who's been affected by wrongful incarceration as a result of being mentally ill, reach out. People came to Texas and they helped me build a cell, a six foot by nine foot cell. And we transported that cell. We built it in, my the in the theater that I founded. And we transported that cell from the theater to the grounds where my brother was being held. And I did a 24 hour demonstration that was live streamed, uh, the public theater li live streamed it. Um, and hundreds of people watched it. Um, and since then, uh, my brother was released back to my family. But the hundreds of people that I've met and connected with as a result of that, I looked them in their eyes and I made a promise to not, uh, it wasn't enough that my brother came home. It wasn't enough that the charges were dropped for me. I, I it opened up this door uh, and I was like, I have, to, I have to continue to champion the voices and the stories of people, some of whom are still incarcerated wrongfully just because their meds weren't working or they, they didn't have access to medication, whatever the case may be. So then I found that hundreds of thousands in response to that some really powerful things have come out of that. One thing, uh, the Waco PD, now um, they've opened an entire branch of the police department that responds specifically to mental health crisis phone calls. Um, I did some uh, work uh, campaigning and organizing around 988. And so the work, that work is just beginning and, and, and you, I can never do enough of that. But, um, but my, my relationship to arts and activism is it's, it's long, it's a long, long history. And how is your brother today? He's doing good. He's getting on my nerves. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question for, um, for you, Mr. DeShields. And when I look at your career and all that you've accomplished, you know, the Emmy, the Grammy, the Tony, um, and you're not done. You're, you've got so much more ahead. Uh, those are such glorious, amazing accomplishments. And when I was thinking about it, you know, I realized life isn't always great. There are uh, disappointments that come our way. And I'm just curious whether or not, you know, you have any um, advice or, or thoughts that you could share about the disappointments, the things that, that, that don't happen and how you keep going, how you climb that next mountain, even though um, there's been a challenge put before you. Thank you for that question. Allow me to politely disagree with you. We have difficulties, absolutely. But it is not impossible. The universe always says yes. If we could simply pursue only those blessings that have our names on them, the trouble would disappear. But we are distracted because, well, what did our parents say? Not all that glitters is gold, right? Not every shut eye is asleep. Not every goodbye is gone. So don't pursue someone else's blessing. You cannot find your way to your home by following the path to someone else's house. It's that simple. And stop saying that life is short. It is not short. You can diminish it by the way you live it. But look, at me, at 78, So, now, okay, one other thing. You, you know, 
They won't let me on television because I don't speak in sound bites. But that's okay. He shared that with me in the green room. That's, we're gonna, he says, that's okay. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. I pursued English even from a small boy growing up on Division Street. I pursued English because I wanted to be literate. In that way, check this out. You can always make yourself understood to those who would oppress you. And you would always understand what those who would oppress you don't say because that's what they mean, what they don't say. And in order to read between the lines, over the lines, under the lines, around the lines, you have to master the language that they forced us to learn 500 years ago. And then you look forward to being as beautiful as I am at 17. Right? <laughs> and you are. you are. You are absolutely beautiful. Thank you for, for, that, for that answer. And there was a lot of head nodding over here. Vishmi was very much in agreement. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You want to uh, yeah. tell uh, what you're thinking? Yeah. Um, hearing you say that your, your uh, passion or your gift or whatever belongs to you, belongs to you, it, it's the truth. Because uh, I think right now, uh, me manifesting wanting to win Project Runway and not getting it this first time on season 17. Um, hearing the judges say like, it, it's just not your time. It's not the time right now. Um, since they said that, I didn't go home and stop. I just was like, all right, I, I, I experienced um, disappointment before when FIT didn't accept me. I experienced disappointment when Parsons didn't accept me. And it's always because once I dive deeper into, I asked my principal, why do you think they didn't accept me? I have everything, I've done photo shoots. She was like, the, the truth of the matter is, is the zone of the school you're at. Um, they can't take a person from this area and give you like a, give you, give you a opportunity. So you gotta make your own opportunities. If you stop at one thing that's, that is disappointing, you, you probably missed the next step that was the door that opens for you. So for me, when I did, after season 17, I didn't win, I walked out like I was the winner. I said, I'm gonna out be the winner of season 17. Um, he's, not doing, he's not gonna be able to do what I've been doing. And from there, it was like, well, I don't need that. I, I just have to know that one. And if you keep telling yourself you're the winner, you got what it is that you have, it's gonna come, it's always gonna come. Such an important message. Such a, Stevie, can you answer and then we're going to hand it back over to um, Tanya. What was the question? Just, just navigating the, the disappointments and how you yeah. keep going, challenges. Oh. If you've had any, you might oh, not have yeah. had any. So, I mean, I'm from Waco, Texas. <laughs> you know, um, I, uh, I, I'm thinking about the, when I left, um, when I accepted the position here at, um, at Baltimore Center Stage, um, and I told everyone I was moving to Baltimore, I left the job at Harvard University and slowed down my career. Of, uh, I slowed it down. Well, actually, I haven't slowed it down at all. <laughs> um, but but the, the challenge, of the, I'm thinking about the challenge of the moment that I'm in right now, which is um, I feel like there's this, uh, this social contract has been broken between um, the theater of yesterday, the theater of the present, and the audience of today. And so as, as, as a, a newcomer to Baltimore, and I've been in and out for three years, but I, I moved here four months ago, I've been on this tour of like just talking to folks and asking people, um, what, what do you wanna see on, on stage? What gets you excited? What makes you wanna come, come down to Mount Vernon and kick it with us for an evening? Um, and what stories do you feel like reflect your experience? I've been having this, uh, this, this deep question, uh, deep conversation with the community. What does it have to do with challenges? The theater right now is facing this moment where if it doesn't evolve, it will disappear maybe. Dissolve. Dissolve. And, and, I, and I look at that challenge 
and I and I and I meet it like all the challenges that I've ever met in my life with much uh, with open arms. I'm running towards it. I'm asking questions. I'm leaning into it instead of leaning away from it. Right. And I think that um, when you do that with challenge, you find that the blessing is the blessing is in sometimes the wound. The blessing is in sometimes, you know, like, you know, uh, when, when you injure yourself and your body tells you, oh, you have to move differently to find how to move through the healing of that, how you can facilitate healing, right? And I feel like the, the, my industry is in this moment where it's, there's, it, there's been this social contract that's broken, but the challenge is how do we develop new audiences? The challenge is how do we reinvigorate audiences so that they will uh, connect to the theater in more meaningful ways? Um, and, and the only way to do that is to, is to embrace the challenge. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but that's what I'm thinking about right now. It does. I, I, I really appreciate the, the sharing and the, you know, the honesty. So while we're talking about theater, what is the state of Broadway um, and theater and black theater? Is it still sort of relevant to have sort of a genre of specific here? Talking about knowing that it's black, black history mom and the state of theater knowing, you know, your show that you opened on Broadway, opened, had a great success and then opened and closed really quickly. So can you sort of expand on that? And Andre, if you want to take also sort of the state of Broadway now and what's missing, what's to come? I know I put a lot in that one question. Yeah. Don't hate me. <laughs> you notice in every echelon of American life, When things turn into a cesspool, they say, black people, come clean this up. <laughs> so, we, we are cleaning up Broadway now. <laughs> we are showing in one of many directions that Broadway can go. But, if you do not, as the African proverb of the Sankofa bird teaches us, if you do not look over your shoulder while progressing forward, you will miss the lesson. Because if you don't know where you're coming from, it is impossible to know where you're going. Broadway doesn't know where it's coming from. It thinks it created itself. We created Broadway. Now, this is what has to happen globally if we want to save not only ourselves, but all of our siblings across the world. We have to re establish black civilization because that what was destroyed in order to create the civilization that is now crumbling. We have to undo colonialism step by step. We have to return the wealth to its source. Now I know this is metaphorical, but we have to look at one another and say, please forgive me for the wrong I have done you. Civilization to civilization. And then others of us have to say, I forgive you for the wrong that you have done me. Now let's go about reparations. Repairing the wound that we have caused ourselves. And it has something to do with shekels, but not everything is money. Simple things like 
Let's coordinate. Let's cooperate. Let's communicate. Let's collaborate. Let's do something cohesive. Let's look at what makes us the same and stop looking at what we think makes us different. One other thing, everyone is talking about how stressed out we are, right? And they blame it on the pandemic. Check this out. If you ever feel stressed, if you ever feel outside of yourself, whatever it is that's bothering you, write it on a piece of paper and go to the mirror and put it up in front of the mirror because the mirror, what, flips it. Now, just to give you an example, everyone says, oh, I'm so stressed, Duh. right? Well, if you wrote stressed on a piece of paper and held it up to the mirror, what would it spell? Desserts. So come on, y'all. Flip the script. Nobody knows better how to flip a script than black folk. That's right. Come on, we are the most unique culture on the planet. Why? Because in one, one generation, we learned a new culture, a new language, a new religion. Right? And we not only thrived, we did not only survive, but we are now ultimately prevailing. So let's teach those who would not learn from us initially. We're not angry, we're not upset, but we do have the answer. Can I, can I jump in there, Brother DeShields, on the, on the flipping of the script? Um, I, I think for me, when you know, when you work on a show and it moves to Broadway and then it gets six Tony nominations, the most nominations for a straight play, like in its category that year. Um, and then the show closes so, so, so quickly, um, talking about, you know, um, you were talking about um, your, your experience of uh, Bishmi of um, not getting into the FIT or losing the first, the first right. So in that moment, you know, um, I remember, I never will forget, Jordy Cooper, who was the youngest uh, playwright, black or otherwise, to be on Broadway, um, and also uh, the youngest uh, uh, writer in television history, showrunner in all of television history. I never will forget the night that we that we found out that we were going to have to close early. We had just opened, um, and uh, I was I was. Uh, was it like six days? It was, it was like six, yeah, six days. So, so I was, I, I had like a hundred jobs. I was rushing from teaching. I was teaching at NYU, and I was, I was going uh, to the dressing room, and I went back to the dressing room of this Broadway Theater, Belasco, and Jordan is laying down on the floor, looking up at the ceiling, and tears are rolling out of his eyes. And he asked, he said, "Brother," he was like, "Brother, how could this happen?" And I remember just like holding him and we just began to pray. And I walked out of that, that theater that night and, um, and I, 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 I saw the performance. There, were, there had never been that many black people in a Broadway theater house. They didn't know what to do with that kind of radical attitude. People were literally talking back to the stage because Ain't No More was so radical and what it did in that space. Um, but I, I walked out of the theater that day and I told myself, I've got the biz I've got the show of it. I understand the show of it. A Princess Grace Award, Obie Award, Tony nominations. So I understand the show of it, but the business of it, I'm gonna position myself so that I can become a champion for other young writers and other young directors, and then God makes a way, this job becomes available. What does Baltimore have to do with flipping the script? Baltimore is strategically poised to be the premier theater in the nation that moves plays from here to New York, to Broadway, and then beyond. Strategically poised to do that. BCS, Baltimore Center Stage, next year we have three plays 
that we're developing in house. We have uh, we have Broadway producers and like highly decorated writers circling our building that will be developed. We'll be developing and incubating new stories right here in Baltimore that will leave here and go to Broadway, leave here and go to New York, leave here and travel internationally. May 1st, we're announcing our, our season next year. It's gonna, it's gonna burn your eyebrows off. It is so phenomenal. It's so phenomenal. And since we're talking about flipping the script and we're talking about black history, we have a show up right now. It's open on March 14th called Mexodus. How many of you know that the Underground Railroad didn't just go north, but that it also traveled south? Hallelujah. To Central and South America, to Mexico. So Mexodus is a hip hop musical that depicts through music the story of our enslaved ancestors who escaped and found freedom traveling south on the Underground Railroad. Original music. So y'all, you, you don't have to go to New York to hear that. You can go right to Mount Vernon and check out that, right? But, but I'm here um, not just as, as, not, not as, a, as someone who houses talent, but now as a business professional who's saying, I understand how this business works now. Having worked on a show, we raised, Lord have mercy, I didn't want to get into the numbers, but the, the, it was like a million dollars in the span of, of less than a week to make sure that we could stay open so that the Tony nominators could come to see our show. And, I began, they, nominated and then they nominated us. And then they, well, the thing is, is, is that, that by the time that the word got out, it was almost too late to, 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 to pull things, to pull things back. But now, um, now that I'm here, now that I've found home, I'm so excited about, you know, a year from now, two years from now, when things are moving from Baltimore, going to Broadway, going beyond, beyond that. And people are saying like, where did that happen? Oh, that was built in Baltimore. And so it also becomes strategic and, and important to me as an artist to be a part of the sea change and the narrative change about, about the way that the world talks about this city. You know? And you all get to be a part of that. Like, now, now I'm gonna do my commercial. Every time you come to support a play at Baltimore Center Stage, you're a part of shifting the narrative, both on the local level, but also understanding that we're, we're getting ready to shift the narrative on, the, on a national level. So please, uh, please participate, please show up. You get to be a part of that, that cultural shift. Did you want to talk anything? Did you want to talk a little bit about the business of fashion, some of the challenges, some of the work? Yeah, um, one of the things that I realized um, that I wish I had like a mentor or someone around when I was like 15 or something, um, I already had the understanding of how to obtain commercial um, audience or an audience who want uh, pieces that are avant-garde style, um, but understanding and digging deeper inside and realizing that as a black designer, the opportunities that are presented to other designers aren't there for me. Um, financial or even understanding um, that though there are places uh, specifically for black designers to like, uh, get this information. So a lot of times, like, you have to do your own research and it gets a bit tiring, but um, what I wish, and now that I'm happy that I'm working on now, is just, again, surrounding yourself around people who do that job already um, and just help uplift the vision that you have. Um, the difficulty, a lot of times, no one realizes that fashion is, it's a, it's a rich people's sport. It's not anything, you know, you can't sit there and, I. All of the funding comes from me. The majority of the times, like I have to fund stuff, but now understanding the business side of it, um, sponsorships, that's where sponsorships come from. Um, create these uh, relationships with bigger businesses that wants a black person so they can have that diversity on their, and within their portfolio. So now, for me, it's just understanding that I'm more than just a black brand. I'm a, I'm a brand that showcases, um, that done so much from TV to helping out and doing other stuff behind the scenes, from tailoring work to finally getting the recognition I've been working so hard to get. Mm -hmm. So now it's like, um, since I know that side of creating, I, I can design and do something with my eyes closed, but the uh, best thing for anybody of color, black, um, just to get the business side of it and see how it can help you. Um, just because one door says no, 
it's another door that's going to be like, we've been waiting for you to, to come knock on the door so that we can help you. So it's just not, you have to have, be the big T. And I call, I call the big T tenacity. You got to have, you just got to keep going through it, whatever it is. As someone who did fashion in New York, I understand the struggle. I wasn't a designer, but I worked in the PR and marketing places. And it's, it's a hard, it's a hard, hard business to crack. It's yes. Hard. Um, we're going to take some aud um, audience questions, yeah, correct? Yeah, it, we're, 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 we're starting to wind down, but we wanted to give an opportunity for anyone, not, not anyone, but just, this a, lady just here. a couple who might have questions. Yep. Yeah. Um, all right. Mike. Yeah. <laughs> this is me, former Mayor Catherine Pugh. Hello. Welcome back to Baltimore. Hello. Hello. Yes. Um, mine's is a request. As the founder of the Baltimore Design School, which is fashion, architect, and design, when you talk about the business part, and I think even many of us who've gone to college and so forth, if you've been to business school, most of the time, they, nobody's even been in business. And you say, well, how can you teach me business when you've not been in business? So my request is for you to come to the Baltimore Design School. We start from sixth grade. We're now in our 11th year. And I started it, and uh, it is continuing to grow. It's one of the best schools in Baltimore. And I know that you and others like you did not have that kind of opportunity. So we would love to have you. Uh, so that's a request. Oh, that's not a problem. Okay. Not and then to say, um, you know, we were with you when you went through the first season, and we're just so glad to see you yeah. now. <laughs> I, I, I thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I feel like having the. I, even walking through that was I wish I had this because um the skills that you are like they adapt you with and put into you are is something that's like as soon as you get in the industry you're like I, I wish mm -hmm. someone helped me with this and um most of the times it's best to have to kind of like go through it because you can study everything but it definitely um it's definitely definitely not like going through it once you go through it, you, you get all the answers and stuff, so. And do you know the manufacturing side? That's my last piece, because we've also started in manufacturing. We have a, man, a black manufacturing clothing plant here in Baltimore. Like we have oh yeah, we need that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, again, another thing that I helped to start, so really excited that you're back. Oh, thank you. Have a conversation. At least for 24 hours. That's okay. Yeah, I'll be back for 24 hours. That's okay. You got it. Right. Made a big impact. Any other questions? Is there another person? Oh, um, thank you. Wait, wait, Mike. Are you going to tell us something? Can we see the three of you work on a project together? I'm, I'm already working on that. I'm working on that backstage. <laughs> so we're going to get both of these brothers back real soon. I said to my brother, the first thing I said to my brother Stephen when we shook hands and hugged, I said, I want you to know something. I have yet to work at Baltimore Center State. Oh. Isn't that a crying show? We have to fix that. We have to fix that. Robin, Stevie. Okay. We have a question back here. And now. Dr. DeShields, how do you know when, um, how do you know when a path is your own? So like when you start on a journey, there's sometimes it's easy, sometimes there's obstacles. How do you know when to push through the obstacles or when to pivot? Because this is maybe not the path that you're meant to be on. Now I warn you, I don't speak in sound bites. <laughs> but here's the answer. Are you familiar with Thomas Merton by any chance? Will be familiar with Thomas Merton, M-E-R-T-O-N. He was a Jesuit priest. Jesuits take vows of poverty. So whatever money they generate, it goes to the church. And what they get is a candle and a desk and a pad and a pencil. He was a great writer. And one of his most excellent collection of essays is New Seeds of Contemplation. And he answers that question. And here's his answer. I'm paraphrasing, of course. 
you must sit alone in the dark with yourself until whatever God you pray to says to you this way. Because the many gods that you don't pray to will say, choose any way you want, right? There's something sparkling everywhere. But you have to believe that there is a path that will lead you to your destiny. straight and narrow. Now I'm going to tell you how I interpreted that for myself. God, don't move that mountain. I'll find my way around it. This man uses the word tenacity, stamina, self-determination, self-determination. Right? And you'll have to go through, what's that song the Shaka Khan sings? You have to go through the fire. You have to go through the fire. But don't be discouraged. Now I'm gonna wax poetic. Because everyone is using the term existential crisis now, and no one really understands it. But here it is. When you find yourself perched capriciously on the precipice of the abyss, jump. Only one of two things will happen. Either you will sprout wings and soar, or the net will appear. Mm. Amen. I myself have been teaching since I was 19, so something I've always struggled with is the idea of those who can't do teach. And I think it's kind of a fallacy, but it's something that kind of comes back to me. So I'm curious, um, how education in any capacity has remained important to you, any of you, all of you, in your individual pursuits, if that makes sense. Uh, can I go? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, for me, uh, I was eager to go to FIT. I was eager to be in Parsons. I was like, e but once they informed me that, uh, once my principal was like, it's because of this, where you're at that they won't give you a chance. It was like, well, why won't I give myself a chance? So I applied and I got accepted to the University of YouTube and I went on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> I, went, I went on YouTube and figured out all this stuff. <laughs> YouTube, what is YouTube? Of uh, University of YouTube is uh, I I literally would be on YouTube whatever it is I need to find whatever it is I need to make do it and those people sometimes your God given um, gift is to uh, talk to people in a language that a teacher or another person wouldn't have been able to do but your your passion to be able to get the knowledge and fuel a person to pursue their thing is also the same that you can get for yourself as being a teacher. You're teaching a person and giving them the confidence to go through. And all it is is obtaining the knowledge so you feel confident, confidence enough to do what it is that you want to do. Um, so I feel like teachers are, actually are uh, really, really important. I, I'm really big on learning. I teach myself everything from um, the reason why I meditate, to the reason why I, I run, to the reason why I am a designer, what type of designer I want to be. I, I got to learn from um, past designers that don't look like me and designers that do look like me in order to become the designer that I know I can be. So. Yes, and I'll be brief. 
But you know there's an African proverb, from cradle to grave, seek knowledge. You know, the first library was on the continent of Africa. I keep saying it, we have to restore the civilizations that we destroyed in order to return to whatever brilliance it is that we own. When I was pursuing my master's degree, my professor of Shakespeare said, I'm going to this, the class, I'm going to teach you a word that you will never find in any dictionary. You'll find the root of the word, which is innate. But the word I'm going to teach you is innatism. And to this day, I can't find it in any lexicon. However, he says, it means we know everything we need to know. We simply don't know that we know it. <laughs> so I think, thank you. We're gonna wrap this up. Um, is there anything else that we should know about the three of you before we, Dana? No, we're I'm not wrapping this up. I was wondering if we could just take one more question and give it to um, Jamel Howard who oh, sorry, has Jamel. done so much to make tonight happen uh, on behalf of the Office of Equity and Civil Rights. So Jamel. Good evening, gentlemen. And then back to you, Tom. Quick question. Um, today, you know, we live in a world where on the one hand, artificial intelligence and technology are an increasing part of our lives and in many ways they're threatening the work of people that work in your industry. And on the other hand, we're also combating a series of initiatives to claw back a lot of that diversity, equity, and inclusion programs and initiatives that have made it possible for people of color to be in these spaces. So my question would be, what do y'all see as the role of local government institutions, as well as professionals in the industry like yourselves in safeguarding the arts for people, young people of color in the future to get into, uh, but also making sure that this is something that protects what we have already done? For me, uh, I hope this answer is, I think this answer for me, um, I grew up around rec centers, around being like in communities of like um, being able to go in my neighborhood on Cremont and learn about computers, learn about drawing, learn about everything. So for me, it started with making sure that the children inside the community have a safe space to go to to fully be themselves. Um, not seeing rec centers, for me, it was, it was, it was so much within those rec centers of uh, maybe Maybe at the time I didn't know, but my friend couldn't eat at home. So they was able to come to the rec center to eat. Maybe they didn't have a talent, but there's so many games, there's so many in, in, uh, music stuff, different subjects that you can learn from. And then there's people that's from your neighborhood that look like you, but call this place the safe place. Um, it might be a guy that's in there that, that, uh, that misbehaves, but he knows to come there. He only misbehaves because he's trying to find, figure out how he can become cool within this place. He knows this place feels good. I think that the future lies in the children and making sure that they see and are equipped with um, certain things that help them flourish and do what they want. Because uh, I don't want to say we're we are already old, but if we could get the answer, I feel like for me, you can get the answer from helping. Uh, the kids of tomorrow, and uh, that's that's how I feel. That's what popped in my head when you asked that. I don't think that um, AI will ever be able to duplicate what um, the artist can duplicate. You know, and so like, um, it's great. I, I don't. I don't feel. I don't mean. I don't feel threatened by AI. I think that like um, it's just not possible. Um, I know for writers, we talk about the industry and writers rooms and things like that. There's a lot of organizing and protesting that has happened to, to you know, uh, with the Writers Guild and with Actors Equity to fight for their rights to, um, to not like having high infringe. So that kind of mobilization is important. Um, but in terms of like, um, the, uh, there's this quote by Octavia E. Butler that I love um, that uh, says, everything you touch, you change. 
and everything you change changes you. So like how I like catalyze that is my job coming from, um, I come from like deep poverty in the deep South. You know, thanks be to God who caused us to triumph. My life was quite different than how it started. But, uh, but every step of my journey, if you let me in, I'm the kind of person be like, yo, the door open, come in here. I'm gonna hold it as wide as I can and let as many people in as possible. And so what ends up happening is, even if you try to legislate backwards, the people that have come in, you know, I, 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 I stand on your shoulders, Mr. Shields, on the shoulders of, of, of a great generation, you know? And so like, it is the generation before, before us who held the door open that changes and makes it more possible for us to walk into these spaces. And then it's incumbent upon us, no matter what folks try to do to legislate, once you let us in, and once we each one teach one, the old forever new thing, right? If you open the door for someone else, and they open the door for someone else, like policy can try to revert as much as it wants to, but the will of the people, I don't think it could ever be defeated. You know, and so I take heart in knowing that, um, that my job, is to make sure that I leave the door open and that I make sure that the, the heart is ablaze so that people can come and light their torches and pass them back or pass them forward rather. Um, so be of good courage, I guess is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Government can never achieve what you asked. Government is an upside down pyramid. It serves the apex, which they think is the most important, when indeed the most important is the foundation. You ever hear people say, oh, I'm the low man on the totem pole? Well, good. You're the foundation. You're holding up the whole thing. Now, there, there's a reason that AI is called artificial, because it is fucking artificial. <laughs> Artists, AI can never do what artists do because artists are dedicated to serving the least, the last, the lost, and the lonely. So come to us if you're in need of anything. We'll nourish you with three essential ingredients will entertain you, will enlighten you, and if you hang out with us long enough, we'll feed you a little ecstasy. <laughs> I think that's the last word. <laughs> So we want to thank our guests. And first of all, I want to thank Dana Moore for the vision to put this together. <laughs> the magical Andre DeShield. <laughs> the visionary. <laughs> and the transformer. And thank you, Tanya Miller, for your brilliance. Tanya Miller Hall, thank you.